the most mm -hmm. Czech Republic. Yeah. I'm very happy that you find your time for myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously I'll have questions that are repetitive in a way to you. I mean, you mm -hmm. must have had answered them many times. Sure, <laughs> but we can try a different angle every but time. Maybe we can yeah. try a different angle. <laughs> Both my parents are journalists, so really? I'm very oh, used to this. Poor you. <laughs> Okay. No, I think journalists make great parents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll tell it to my two small kids. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, this is my phone. Sure. I'm, I'm going to record the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's a table yes, here, uh, uh, so yeah, if yeah, we, yeah, 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 I can. I sure. Can okay. This okay. Good. Perfect. Yeah. So first question, Minister, is obvious. What I understood from reading about you and about Taiwan, you are uh, one of the architects of the Taiwanese successful response to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. One of and the then, many, but yes. yes. Uh -huh. So, yes. <coughs> so the question is, how exactly, what was your uh, a specific role in the taming of pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, our idea is that if uh, three quarters of the population wear masks, then the R0 value will be under 1, which means that the virus will not spread. So very, very early on, our goal is just to get three quarters of people to start wearing masks. I understand that this is also the Czech playbook, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so uh, my work uh, is threefold. It's called fast, fair, and fun. The mm -hmm. fast part is to make sure that anyone, for any reason, if they don't uh, want to wear a mask, if they doubt if the mask is useful and so on, or if they do not connect mask use to hand sanitation, we make sure that there's a toll-free number, 1922, where they can call and get a very convincing argument on um, you know, dispelling their anxiety and fears and myth and so on. But if they call saying, you know, I'm a boy, I don't want to go to school because you're rationing masks or I get a pink medical mask. Uh, and then the very next day on the daily press conference, uh, the medical officers, including our minister Chen Shizhong, start wearing pink medical mask. So the boy become the most hip boy in his class. So he will be able and willing to wear the mask. Uh, and so in each ministry of a team of participation officers that work with hashtags. So whenever there's a trending hashtag that seem to discourage mask use and so on, we engage them with humor, uh, make very funny dog pictures. Uh, and that's the fun part in fast, fair, and fun. For example, um, there was uh, a physical distancing rule uh, where the dogs, um, that is the spokes dog, uh, and for this I have to use my slides here. Okay. Um, the spokes dog uh, here, uh, is called Zong Chai, uh, and it is the dog that lives with the Ministry of Health and Welfare's um, participation officer. And so when we it's explain, it's like a real dog. It, you know, it's a real dog. It's a Shiba Inu. Uh, and <coughs> so whenever there's a new um, idea like physical distance, we just say if you're outdoor, you have to keep two dogs away. Indoor, <laughs> keep three dogs away. Or you wear a mask. But why do you wear a mask? You wear a mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands. But maybe I understood you yeah. badly, but why did you choose this dog, particularly this one? Is it popular race among... Um, yeah, this is the, the internet meme. There was a meme called Doga, uh -huh. right? The Doga meme is a Shiba Inu. It's okay. this kind of dog smiling very innocently, and you can add random words to it. It's a very popular internet meme. And the participation- In Taiwan? In, uh, in, in the world. In if the you, world? Yeah, if you, if you search for D-O-G-E, doge, okay. you will see, um, and actually just to prove my point, I guess, uh, right. we, we'll do the search right here. <coughs> and then you will see that there's a, <coughs> a Wikipedia article. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I, I'm just asking because we have uh -huh. poodles, I think. In, uh -huh. in the Czech Republic, it will be poodles, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a trending topic. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So sure, yeah, of course. It, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it, it could be. Oh. So, so, right. Okay. So, they look sufficiently similar. And it's, it's a real dog that lives with the participation officer. And so, uh, we just, you know, translate all these memes uh, into very easy, easy to share, easy to understand. And this is called the uh, uh, humor over rumor. And okay. this is the fun part. One more question yes. for the fun part. When you say <coughs> you, 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 you can use hashtags in mm -hmm. order to yes. activate the population yeah. by the mask, can you give me an example of mm -hmm. a popular fun hashtag that worked well mm -hmm. in reality? Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. So in Taiwan, <laughs> uh, there's many actually. There was a hashtag uh, on, on Twitter that called, uh, this attack come from Taiwan. Um, 
So let me just wait for this not very quick internet connection. <laughs> and right. it's not even grammatically correct. But anyway, <laughs> so, so there was this um, idea of this, tech, this attack uh, come from Taiwan. Uh, and it's actually a popular um, crowdsourcing campaign. So, oh, actually they use the right English form, comes from Taiwan. So I guess I should uh, adjust the form as well. Okay. Right, so this is a very popular hashtag. This raised a very large amount of NT okay. dollars. Uh, and the basic idea is that uh, at one time, uh, Dr. Tetris uh, from WHO uh, said that uh, there was attacks against him. And this attack comes from Taiwan, so that was his words. Uh, <laughs> right? And at that time, WHO was not recommending mask use. Now they are. They are issuing the mask challenge and so on. But this was long ago. This was back in April. Um, and so we, at that time, start donating masks to the international humanitarian aid. Uh, and so people sarcastically describe this mask donation as this attack comes from Taiwan because we attack other humanitarian organizations with masks. Because <laughs> it was popular, what, uh -huh. is it, what was the traffic? How many retweets? Oh, it, it, was, it was trending. It was uh, like the top trending hashtag in, in Taiwan so at the time. And millions it, of millions? Yeah, of yeah cer certainly, certainly, so certainly millions. millions. Uh, and then it <coughs> resulted <coughs> in this huge crowdsourcing and crowdfunding campaign that eventually turned into a New York Times advertisement. And they bought an advertisement, said, who can help? Taiwan can help. And then get our vice president to uh, record a crash course on epidemiology, because he's also our top epidemiologist. Uh, and so, th so this not only became uh, a New York Times advertisement, it actually became a whole website that shows how people are contributing. For example, more than 700,000 citizens donated more than 6 million masks. It's in addition to our foreign service donation. It's addition the, to it. In addition to it. It's people in their uh, ration quota, if they have something uh, like a um, you know, storage uh, at home that they already have some masks, they can say, OK, I will forfeit uh, this rationing. Like nowadays, it's, uh, every two weeks, it's nine for adults and 10 for children. Uh, they can say, OK, I go to an app. I forfeit uh, my collection rights. Uh, I will want to go it, to go to um, Czech Republic <laughs> or any other. <laughs> humanitarian so all is done, aid. Uh, electronically, so mm -hmm. um, yes. you don't have to it's on physically. No, 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 no. It's on an app, right? So if you type my name, uh, you will see that Tang Feng, my name, have dedicated 36 masks. But that's not true because I only <laughs> did six. The other are Tang Feng Ping, Tang Feng Ming, and Tang Feng Xian. That is to say, people who share my name. Uh, they they, they uh, together dedicated. And this, is, uh, this went viral. Like many people click share. And that's why this number still keeps increasing. And we uh, update it every day. And you can see it in this not at all government website. This is the crowdfunded website, Taiwan okay. Can Help Data. And this all started from the hashtag this attack on comes from Taiwan. Okay. Yeah. You also had, what I understood, a positive um, experience with this mask map. Oh, yeah. What was the story with the mask yeah, that's map? The fair, that's the fair part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in Taiwan, the government services uh, end in the website .gov.tw, so yeah. something .gov.tw. For example, our e-participation website is joingovtw, where you can start petitions and visualize budget and so on. Uh, but uh, there's a community cook of zero that turns every website that they don't like into a alternate version, forking the government, so fork the government um, into G0V. So for each government service, you can change a O to a zero, and chances are you'll get into this shadow government, Gov0, uh, that is open source, that does the same thing, but okay. in a more fun way. Okay. And so in this sense, it, uh, the demonstration is not about protesting. This is about demo, like showing the government how better could public services be delivered. And so on the Gov0 channel, there was a person, uh, was named Howard Wu, Wu Jiangwei, who demoed this map that says, uh, Essentially, nobody know where the uh, stores that still have masks or the store that run out of masks. Instead of people just sharing on social media, which is impossible to track, he offered this map that people can easily uh, mark uh, the numbers. Uh, and so that if it's green, it means he you still have plenty of it. To, to everyone. For free. for free. For everyone. And paying the Google API usage fee okay. by himself. And so after... That's a little money. 
Yes. So he owed uh, Google twenty k US dollars in just a couple of days. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Did and, you pay for him? And we, we asked Google to use their CSR budget, and they waived uh, their usage fee. In exchange, uh, I personally made a website called musk.pedis. Uh, that is the main go-to website if you ask, for example, Apple's Siri, uh, where can you find Musk in Taiwan? It goes to this website that I wrote. Uh, and so mask dot, I don't see it. Mask P D I S. Okay. Public okay. Digital Innovation Space. That's my office. Oh, okay. So it's a government website, but all it does is it links to more than 140 different applications that visualize the mask availability, and we'll just use the first one. <coughs> and this one, for example, shows that around us now, the red ones are out of masks. The green ones do have masks, and you can do navigation, and this is their opening schedule, and things like that. And so because uh, this is equally provided for everyone, e even people with uh, like seeing difficulties and so on, they can use voice assistant, as I mentioned. They can use the chatbot, and so on. So everybody has the same inclusive access to where the masks are. And because this information is updated very quickly, uh, I think starting from the early uh, February, this updated every 30 second. And so when I'm queuing in line, I will be able then uh, for the person before me to swipe their NHI card, National Health Insurance card, and get nine medical masks. I would just refresh this map and see this before my eyes that it turns to 49. And so this builds a assurance that this system is fair without people having to trust the government. This is participatory accountability. If rather this number stayed the same or it actually goes up, I would call 1922 the toll free line right there and say that something is wrong. So that when we're ramping up mass production, people don't have to trust the government. They can trust the numbers that is collectively audited, made accountable by everybody queuing in the pharmacies. Mm -hmm. And so this reached maybe 70% of people, but that's not still not, uh, three quarters. And so then we start so working with. There at, the three, three quarters, uh, at the end of February. So at March, we started uh, something new we called e mask. So instead of just queuing at a pharmacy, they can collect the pre ordered mask in the uh, convenience stores. Because people who couldn't uh, go to the pharmacy, most of them have very long working hours. So right. by the time they went back home, the pharmacy have all closed. Yeah. So they have to uh, work with the convenience stores. And so our premier smiles happily here. That's because in March, we work as a convenience store and you can pre-order on your mobile phone. And that pushed the number all the way to almost 90%. But we're, we're not uh, you know, uh, giving uh, this uh, satisfactory resident or laurel yet. We say, oh, what about the other like 12%? Turns out, some of them don't have a mobile phone, maybe very elderly people, and maybe uh, they do not have the time to go to the queue, or maybe they're more fragile. Uh, and so we started working with convenience stores, so they can just take your NHI card, and the uh, staff, uh, these people, can help them to use the kiosk to pre-order, but they can't choose which convenience store to collect, and they have to collect on the same store the next week. And then after that rolls out, we are now at 95%. So almost everybody have access to medical mask now. And the other 5%, maybe they have plenty of mask already at home, so they can donate to international humanitarian aid. So that's the full system that we made. Okay. One question that comes to the fast is that how did you ensure um, the production uh, capability of Taiwan, so to say, to have enough masks mm -hmm. physically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You started in January, mm -hmm. or when did you start? Yeah, we started in January uh, to procure the necessary equipments because oh. Taiwan used to produce a lot of masks. So the know-how is still there. Mm -hmm. All we need is a way for the precision machinery, smart production machinery lines. people to assemble into production lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's exactly what I did. Uh, so I think early January, they decided that we need to make the masks. At that time, it's less than 2 million masks a day. Uh, but around uh, April, when we're starting to roll it out in convenience stores, the peak was 20 million masks a day. That is to say, almost uh, one day per person uh, per masks. Uh, but we also discover ways, for example, using a traditional rice cooker, uh, you can reuse the mask for three times or five times uh, by disinfecting the mask, t killing the virus, but not disrupting the material. And that enables each mask to have like three or five times of lifespan. And so that's when we start to have sufficient mask supply. That, uh, that's around early April or late uh, March. Okay. In the case of the Czech Republic, we had some uh, problems with 
I'd say coordination of the decision line. So yeah. we say there was the government, there was epidemiologists, mm -hmm. you know, there yes. was this board of scientists. Yes. I see that. And and they tend mm -hmm. to disagree or publicly mm -hmm. argue with each other. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how did you make sure mm -hmm. that this line works mm -hmm. well or worked well? With the political time? yeah, with the political decision yeah. maker. So yeah. who is in charge actually? Mm -hmm to change the pandemic in mm -hmm, Taiwan? Mm -hmm, is, it mm -hmm. is it your prime minister? Mm -hmm, is it the, mm -hmm, the chief ep uh, epidemiologist? Mm -hmm. Who is right, the chief epidemiologist. Yeah. But when our chief epidemiologist, literally the author of the textbook on epidemiology in colleges, want to convince the vice president, he only has to look into the mirror because he is the vice president. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it easy. <laughs> it makes it very easy. Uh, and so Minister Chen Shizhong uh, basically implements the uh, scientific advices that our Vice President gives. Uh, and uh, with, at that time, Vice Premier uh, Chen Ximai uh, also makes sure that all the ministries works in coordination with the health ministry. So uh, Ximai Chen, uh, Chen Ximai, our Vice Premier at the time, uh, Chen Shizhong, uh, our health minister and the commander of the CECC, and uh, Chen Jianren is called the Three Chen. And the Three Chen forms this team that is, uh, and they are all, uh, you know, trained uh, in public health and epidemiology. Vice Premier Chen Ximai was a student of Chen Jianren. Uh, and so they don't have a problem talking to scientists because they just, you know, look into a mirror. Okay, yeah. so, so there was not a problem in, in Taiwan where people not were at all. contesting the decision because not at all. it even was more, more, most, or more political than scientific or mm -hmm. vice versa. Not at all. You didn't well, have I mean, they are also seasoned politicians. So they also talk politicians' language, but they're also trained as doctors or public health experts. So they also talk the scientific knowledge uh, language. And so I think part of the political training is that they do not say that they know everything because they have to, that they're, they're around. Actually, um, Dr. Uh, VP Chen Jianren was around, actually in charge of the health bureau when SARS 1.0 came to Taiwan in 2003. So he has a lot of experience uh, of SARS 1.0. But all of them keep saying SARS 2.0, that is the novel coronavirus, is novel, means that we don't know about it. We're still learning about it. So we are humble. And if anybody think that they know something about SARS 2.0 that's different from SARS 1.0, please call 1922. And we can learn about this together. And this is very important. Okay. Is this telephone line, as you just mentioned, is it very popular? Many it's very popular. It? Many people call it. The, the immediate pickup rate is more than 90%. Uh, and whenever there is a uh, kind of public um, like focus uh, on a uh, certain issue, it could uh, go up to like um, a million or so calls a day at, at, at its peak. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, for, for all those app, apps and internet sites and sort of open source uh, platforms, you have to have the trust of the people. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain the fact that the people trust the government so much that they are ready to you know, give you the private data that you can go into quarantine and be watched via your telephone? Because I cannot imagine that in my country it would go down with the people quite easy, the mm -hmm. fact that mm -hmm. you would be watched. Mm -hmm. uh, Telephone yeah, it's not just telephone. I mean, 1922 is a set of technologies. The telephone may take, <coughs> you know, tens of thousands uh, or close to hundreds of thousands calls a day. And each call on average, I think, is six minutes. But there are also people who do not prefer calling a phone. So there's also chatbots. And there are also chatbots uh, with like 2 million subscribers. It's called Ji Guan Jia, developed with uh, HTC, which is a Taiwanese uh, technology company. Uh, and so when I say 1922, this is not just one telephone line. It's also chatbot. It's also uh, this online Q&A system and so on. And altogether, it receives more than a million or so uh, traffic uh, per day. It's not just the telephone line alone. But I think the point here is that the government need to trust the citizens, mm -hmm. not the citizen trusting the government. In Taiwan, we trust okay. the citizens in the sense that we use the uh, social innovation, that is to say, uh, the traditional rice cooker thing, that's not invented by people in the government. That's by Professor Lai Chen Yu. Uh, and we initially was skeptical about that idea. But then we do the confirmation. And when the confirmation uh, worked, then in the uh, daily CECC press conference, um, they invited Lai Chen Yu to explain his method uh, and then just amplify this idea. And I think Minister Chen tried to cook uh, the mask himself. 
itself uh, in the live stream. Uh, and then, uh, for example, the pink medical mouse, as I mentioned. So it's all about people's idea being amplified through the platform of the CECC, not the CECC knowing the best and forcing the people to do things. What's uh, CECC? CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center. Okay. So uh, when we compare it with other nearby jurisdictions, for example, uh, there was a, a time where there was a locally confirmed case uh, that initially the contact tracing didn't quite work. The contact interview, the medical officers, uh, the person keeps saying that uh, they live uh, alone in a house, doesn't come uh, and visit friends and so on. They have a very simple life. Uh, but, but then the next day, the um, medical officer finally got through uh, and then she said that she actually works in an intimate drinking bar uh, as a professional um, waitress. Uh, he, she does not want to compromise the identity of her clients. Uh, so that's why the contact tracing didn't quite work the very first day. Now in many other jurisdictions, it's very difficult to get people who work in dancing clubs, intimate drinking bars, and other places for more intimate contact to work with the CECC. But uh, uh, Commander Chen Shizhong did not impose saying that uh, we're putting people in jail or that we're ha ha imposing a heavy fine uh, for violating and things like that. No, but he said, uh, everybody understand the idea of physical distancing and leaving your uh, accurate contact numbers when you're entering a densely packed as dancing clubs and intimate drinking bars are. So he challenged them to think of ways to keep physical distancing and also keep this real uh, contact system. Uh, and he said that um, before you can do that, of course, we discourage people from visiting such places. So notably, he doesn't cast them as kind of outsiders of okay. the of the uh, measures and after a couple of months I think just a month or so uh, some drinking bars start to offer drinking ways to like uh, a plastic shield oh. so you can still drink it's transparent but you can't kiss I guess uh, and then and then they also uh, use this kind of scratch paper so that uh, if you enter such places you have to leave your contact number where they do an SMS for you to check uh, or uh, maybe email uh, and things like that but with uh, without requiring you to fill your real name and then after a few weeks after the period um, ends they just uh, shred this paper so that the person who visit can still keep uh, their privacy and so after they impose those uh, two kind of self-regulation measures they, they reopen they are still part of our um, you know team and so I think this maximally inclusive way is a sign of trusting the citizen and trusting the people so people can innovate and to reduce their R value together as a team so as a state, you didn't have to put a substantial effort or substantial energy into convincing population That's right. to transfer you, their data and, 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 and privacy information. Be because first, we never did a lockdown. And we never collect information that we did not previously collect before the pandemic. So these are the two things. Uh, because people, if you uh, collect new data, then people, of course, are wary of where the data will go. But if you, you repurpose the data that you're collecting anyway okay. before the pandemic and just use it in a creative way, in an innovative way to counter the pandemic, then it's easier for people to understand the privacy uh, repercussions. Okay. Now, uh, being here, we were told, and it's a fact, that Taiwan is an internet tiger, at least among Asian states. You are part of this revolution uh -huh. as a digital minister. Can you tell me um, a story? How did it happen to Taiwan? Is mm -hmm. it indeed mm -hmm. ICT tiger or mm -hmm. a state that very much uh, focuses on, mm -hmm. economy focuses on ICT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, in my uh, youth, like when I was 12 years old, um, there was uh, the time of modems and ISDN and things like that. And I started learning about this idea of the under-resourced areas, that is to say the telecom company could never earn a profit in such so rural places if they set up even like public call booths there. And then after that, of course, the ISDN lines and modems lines there. And I started learning that uh, no matter where those uh, low resource places are, uh, there's guaranteed connectivity. And the guaranteed connectivity eventually evolved into this idea of the internet as a human right. That is to say, a anywhere in Taiwan, if you cannot connect to the internet, it is the state's fault. 
And in the President Tsai Ing-wen's campaign, uh, the first term campaign four years ago, uh -huh. she campaigned for broadband as a human right, which is upping the stake, right? Anywhere in Taiwan for uh, just 15 euros a month, you can get unlimited data connection uh, for less than, um, you know, 15 euros is around, I think, 10 megabits per second, and it's both ways. So if you don't have 10 megabits per second for unlimited data for uh, 15 euros a month, it's my fault, personally. Uh, and so because of this, uh, even on the top of Taiwan, the Jade Mountain or Savia uh, or Bendugunung, we have 20 national languages, uh, <laughs> right? uh, in, in these very high mountain, like almost 4,000 meters, mm -hmm. you still have very good broadband connection. And this is like not because it makes business sense, it doesn't make a business sense, sense there, but because when we're auctioning the spectrum, for example, for 5G spectrum, mm -hmm. we use the extra auction money to then tell the telecom to fund them to work in the uh, least connected places, the places that is, uh, have least internet utilization. So I think broadband is a human right. We're, we're now uh, achieving Dr. Tsai's uh, campaign promise, and that is also what enabled people to to be able to participate. For example, the mask map wouldn't work if they don't have an internet connection. Exactly. Yeah, if, if people uh, have to pay extra surcharge uh, for each megabyte downloaded or uploaded, they would not use so many digital democracy tools. But because it costs nothing extra, no marginal cost, so people use video conferencing and so on for health, for education, for all sorts of purposes. And I think that more than anything, any single industry is a sign of Taiwan's problem as human right. Uh, uh, approach on this, I don't know, tigerness, but anyway, yeah. that's what we believe in. Okay. Um, does it pay also to say, is it the most important part of your economy now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it so? Yeah, I, I would say that our economy uh, is, um, and I usually use the, the term DIGI because that's our um, national dig yeah. digitization uh, strategy. Um, and it's called DIGI because it's for digitization, that's broadband as a human right. right. Innovation, that is to say new things that potentially breaks the law uh, or existing <laughs> regulations, and we give them a sandbox, that is to say, half a year, a year or so, so that we can co-domesticate. These are self-driving vehicles, uh, and people say that this one eye is scary. This is in my office, by the way. This is literally my office. Uh, really? And yeah, yes, uh -huh. yes, my, my office looks like this. Um, is in the social innovation lab. Uh, these are done, uh, public art is done by people with Down syndrome, uh, with trisomy differences, and they see the world like Van Gogh. So uh, when they draw the world, they see everybody become very creative um, entering this space. And uh, someone, uh, I think by the name of Zednek uh, Khib, visited the space and got so creative. Yeah, and got so creative that his um, small cabinet start climbing. <laughs> we didn't know that these cubes um, are climbable. They're the first people to start climbing on it. I'm, I'm happy that it holds. Otherwise, it would be a diplomatic incident. <laughs> but anyway, uh, right. So, so we focus on the SDGs. Any of the people working on the SDGs, for example, this is, is about uh, smart uh, urban transportation. That's the SDG um, 11, right? A, a sustainable uh, urban uh, fabric and even though it's technically not legal at the time we give them a place to experiment anyway and then people say oh the one eye like a cyclop too scary so it need to be two eyes uh, and so on and so forth and so the things that we learned after the sandbox period now translates into uh, the self-driving bus uh, actually currently now running every midnight uh, in the Xinyi part uh, of the Taipei city and so that's the innovation part it's the sandbox and then the governance part the governance part is participatory governance. People all around Taiwan, even if uh, they cannot travel to Taipei easily, I go to them so that in their uh, town halls in the most rural indigenous remote regions, sometimes with the cultural translator of the indigenous people, is connected back to the social innovation lab with the 12 different ministries. And I tour around Taiwan uh, listening to the people and the people who are empowered, they don't have to you know, condense their case into like one A4 page, but rather just speak their mind uh, and then get listened to by the 12 different ministries so that we can make sure that the governance empower the people who are closest to the pain. So that's the governance part. And finally, the inclusion part. The inclusion part, as I mentioned, uh, we specifically look for people who are disenfranchised. That is to say, people who do not have voting power. Uh, like, for example, people who are 15 years old uh, mm -hmm. or even 14 years old. Okay. 
like, it would be like five more years uh, before they can participate fully, right, in the public um, decision. But in the um, internet participation culture, uh, you only have to have an email that can reach you. We don't care about um, your age. That's why I dropped out of junior high school when I was 15 years old, because I discovered that internet governance doesn't care that I'm just 15 years old. Uh, and then we include the people not only through this reverse mentorship where we ask very young people to be mentors of our cabinet members, but we also enable them to start, for example, e-petitions. And there was a 16-year-old girl, Wang Xuanru, that petitioned for banning of plastic straws. Uh, first wow. for, uh, you know, um, uh, um, like, what's the national identity drink? Bubble tea. Uh, for, <laughs> for the bubble teas, uh, for the indoor use, and then uh, eventually for takeouts. And she successfully gathered more than 5,000 um, signatures. And say, so we sat down and with the people who make such uh, single-use utensils, and eventually um, all the, like, this is, I think, literally from a straw. Uh, from agricultural products that yeah. are at least carbon neutral. I think this may be carbon actually negative. Uh, and, and so the, the plastic use in such straws that could cause marine debris and things like that is actually banned thanks to the 16 years old uh, who brainstorm with people who make such uh, single use utensils. And that uh, doubtless made them more uh, better participants in the future when they actually become adults. So empowering the very young, that is also okay. part of our inclusion plan. One uh, platform us, that is also based on this crowdsourcing, I mm -hmm. would say, which is this V Taiwan or Paul yes. platform. Yes. The one that is um, it aims to tame the disinformation on internet and yes. polarization in the society. It it sparked a lot of interest in Europe. So can you mm -hmm. give me or can you explain me how does it work exactly? And can sure. you give me an example whether you've already used it in your governmental work? Of course. So V Taiwan is uh, in the social sector is a Gov Zero project. So I used uh -huh. to uh, help run V Taiwan. But once I become digital minister, uh, the V Taiwan's um, governance is now uh, firmly in the hands of the uh, social sector. So I can describe uh, to you how it works now uh, and how it used to work uh, when I was, uh, like, strictly speaking, social sector. Uh, but nowadays, like today, uh, V Taiwan is talking about open parliament like how to make the parliament more open. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the work... So open means accessible to public or open, great, or open sessions? Great, great question. Uh, so yes, so here there is the hack folder, that is to say the materials that answers the frequently asked questions. Uh, and it says very simply that uh, there are um, I should have turned on the uh, machine translation, but I'll translate for you anyway. So, <laughs> right. <Thank you>. so right. <laughs> right. So, um, so this says that the legislature needs to uh, make sure that the citizens can use all the information that maximally uh, accessible to legislators. All the citizens need to have, ad, uh, other than you know national secrets and things like that, whatever the legislators see, we should make digital tools to make sure that the citizens see the same information. So that's the uh, first topic. Uh, and also, uh, this is not just about information. It should use structured data. So people who want to make analysis and so on can very easily make machine-to-machine -machine connections and analyze how the legislators perform. And also, people who are um, alternately abled, uh, who have uh, you know, physical or mental conditions and so on, need to also have their voices heard, not through representatives, but through accessible digital technologies, so that they can also attend public hearings and things like that. That's the third topic. And the fourth one is that whenever there is paper copies being pasted around by a legislature for both environmental and social reasons, uh, we should digitize them and make it an online collaborative document so that we can, as citizens, see how the legislators are forming their drafts on a real-time system instead of just by paper copies that is passed around. And finally, uh, we need to work with the educational system so that people as young as you know primary graders uh, can tour the parliament openly and even participate in like mock sessions and so on so that people understand how parliament works as early as they are seven years old and so on so these currently at this very day is the uh, topics that the v taiwan is having a discussion with so that's today's v taiwan when i participated it was in 15 in 16. 
Okay. Yeah. And so if you say today's participation, etc., so to say people can read it, but they can only, oh, they can write comment, but they mm -hmm. cannot like or dislike the other's comment, they can... Uh, they, they could, they could, they, they could, could, of course, upvote, upvote and downvote other people's comments. And this is based on this artificial intelligence system called Polis. Uh, and for Polis, for example, Vita and use Polis in pretty much everything. Uh, but uh, let's take a example of the e-scooters. I think that's the case that... Um, e-scooters? Uh -huh. Yes, e-scooters. Uh, okay. I don't know if... Like the e-scooters in cities? Yeah, I, I don't know if that's a problem in Czech Republic. No, not so, because it's... No, it's, it's because it's colder state, so ah, it's okay. cars, yeah? Right, right, so people do not actually want segways uh, no, <laughs> on the street. No, many, no many. Not many, not many. right. During summer maybe, but it's uh -huh. either cars or uh, bicycles. Okay, so what about Uber? Uh, do you have a Uber problem? Yes, we have Uber. Okay, maybe we use Uber as an example then. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so this is the conversation that we had about Uber. It's a real conversation in 2015. And everybody can just see uh, themselves as an avatar among the people, friends and families that you already know on social media. And they uh, believe very different things about Uber. But they're not nameless trolls or enemies. They're your friends and family. It's just you didn't talk about Uber over dinner, right? And so the <laughs> V Taiwan basically start collecting the facts about Uber and then sh ask people to share their feelings for three or four weeks and then we meet face to face on a live stream conversation to ideate the best idea who is who? Um, like anyone who okay. uh, proposed something that is resonating with okay. people so um, anyone so to answer your question precisely anyone with an email address Okay. Right. So any email address uh, can log in and share their feelings for other people to upvote or downvote. And the people whose ideas resonate with people across those different groups are then invited to brainstorm how to solve the Uber problem um, together. How, how do you guess or how do you see who, what's resonating, so to say, more, most yeah, so likes? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's like. So it's for like example, so for example yeah. if you, you go to uh, the initial Uber conversation, you can see a fellow and says, I think passenger liability insurance is the most important thing. Now, if you agree, if you click agree, so you, you, click you will move here. Your avatar will move here. Okay. Because this is proposed by yours truly, that's me. Uh, and so you will move closer to me. But if you disagree, you will move farther away from me. And once you click agree or disagree, the next statement will come. Until, of course, you feel that you also have something to contribute. And so you offer your idea for other people to vote on. And the beauty of this is that the area here measures the plurality. It does not measure the head count. So even, you, even if you get 2,000 people here voting exactly the same, you just see an extra zero here, but the area will not change. And then you have to convince everyone across all the groups in order for your idea to be set as agenda and for you to get an invitation letter to the live streamed uh, conversation. And so every time we see this picture, that is to say people agree to disagree on a few ideological statements, but actually most people agree with most other people on most of the things, most of the time. And so we just then take this as our agenda and then start ideate and we say registration, insurance, safety and so on are important and then the people commit um, to the consensus because if they don't agree with the people's consensus they actually have to say why so everybody agrees and then that becomes our um, multi-purpose taxi regulation and Uber threatened to, to quit I guess for a while they did quit for a couple months uh, but then they, they went back and nowadays they are registered as a uh, legal taxi fleet the Q taxi and but the search pricing uh, or the dynamic pricing and uh, not having to paint the um, you know car as yellow or things like that these we learn from Uber. So other types of leads can also do the same now. So they are now on the very same uh, playing ground. And that is what we call crowdsourcing the agenda. And, and that's okay. worked very well uh, with my other um, principle, which is radical transparency. Uh, so when people in, in the Uber uh, company uh, lobbied uh, for uh, the results of this uh, conversation, for example, at the time, Uber was employing David Plouffe, uh, a uh, US um, 
I think uh, he was a important assistant to the Obama administration. Uh, and then uh, he lobbied for, for Uber and going to um, my office, um, actually my home office, uh, to, to basically speak for Uber. But because I say everything that we say uh, will be on the record, like I say, literally, note everything you send my way will be made public. Um, this is not only public as a transcript, it's actually, um, if you search for David Plouffe uh, and my name, uh, you will actually see it in virtual reality. So if you have a VR <laughs> device, you will actually uh, like relive the conversation uh, right there. And so in this kind of environment, all his arguments is based on the public good, like uh, carbon footprint reduction, traffic jam reduction, and things like that. It's impossible for him, for him to make arguments that are only good for him and me and bad for everybody else. And so this is like a puzzle, right? People adding pieces of the puzzle without moving anything. Removing anything would be uh, some other game, right? Jenga, I think, that's, that's the game, right? So it would not be a Jenga, it would just be a puzzle uh, that uh, people keep adding on, and then we finally set on something that is like a common value. So that's how the right. Uber problem is, is resolved. We resolve many other things, but I think Uber resonates with your country more. Aren't the MPs, members of parliament, jealous mm -hmm. at you mm -hmm. or jealous mm -hmm. at the you mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. crowd uh, sourcing mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. platforms or mm -hmm. initiatives? Because it basically, mm -hmm. it maybe, or to my eyes, it you know, put them aside a little bit, no? Mm -hmm. No, not, not at all. Not at all? Not at all. And, and we have a, um, I don't know whether you uh, have heard of the idea of the double diamond or design thinking. No. Right. So it's a simple idea from the uh, IDEO, uh, the design term, uh, uh, firm, I-D-E-O. Mm -hmm. And they have this idea that um, most designers work in the um, uh, era of uh, having to listen to people of various positions before they define their work. So they separate the idea of development and delivery uh, on one side, which is what the MPs work on, uh, right? They develop possible new regulations and budgets and uh -huh. so on, and yeah. they charge the administration Those. to deliver them, yes. right? That, that's what they do. Uh, but what we are working on the crowdsourced agenda setting is on the first diamond, which is simply to map out people's feelings. Okay. There is no right or wrong about feelings. It's just to discover people's feelings and then define the common values. How to take the top five or 10 consensus and and make it into a coherent law. That is still the MP's job. What we're doing is basically, this is a more scalable public hearing. In traditional right. public hearing, you can maybe listen to 100 people and not much more. But here, we can listen to hundreds of thousands of people. And, and are you doing it for real? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And so for, for real uh, policies, for example, how to open up the mountains, how to open up the oceans, and so on. Nowadays, not only v Taiwan, because v Taiwan is primarily now in the social sector. Uh, now in the public sector, we also use the tool used by the v Taiwan, namely POLIS. For example, this is how to open up our ocean, how to make sure that everybody have the same access of all the information related to ocean that uh, around the Taiwan. So you can see it at ocean.taiwan.gov.tw and then learn about our, um, our like everywhere, the, the islands and the fishing and the spores and things like that. Uh, and so that how to improve that, that's one of the topics. Uh, and then uh, it's also about how to make sure that they're accessible um, to people of all kinds, how to educate and how to right. make sure that people understand the risks uh, involved and so on. And so in every conversation, um, people just, as I mentioned, have maybe things that are divisive, uh, actually, only one thing divisive in this particular uh, conversation that says we do not need to restrict the species for amateur fishing. We only need to limit it for professional fishing. This is very contentious. Uh, but then <laughs> there's many other statements that are consensual. And so we will just work on the consensual statements to make our ocean policy. So actually, right after our conversation, currently this afternoon, actually right now, because it started at 2 p.m. Right now, <laughs> the people are having the live stream forum to talk about the consensus, and that will then form our ocean policy. Okay, would you recommend platforms like Polis to other states? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, if, mm -hmm. if you say yes, so mm -hmm. yes. why we don't see them? Mm -hmm. Now, in the Western world? Well, you, you, uh, you, you see it in the Western world. Uh, really? The, the Autonivet uh, in Denmark uh, use Polis a lot. Uh, and then uh, the, the a picture that I just 
show you uh, was actually from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, and I mean, Polis started from Seattle. Uh, from a bunch of occupiers. So it's not like it's invented in Taiwan. We're just one of the earlier adopters. Uh, I think the, uh, what, what's the word? Um, the, there's a bunch of people, uh, XR, Extinction Rebellion, right? Uh -huh. uh, the, the XR people uh, also um, use the polis. Uh, actually, many other people too. So if you uh, search for uh, polis in the um, Rome research, I think that's the mm -hmm. um, research knowledge base, uh, you will see so um, you all the uses. You worked in Seattle as well, right? I'm you sorry? You, you worked in Seattle. Too. No, in San Jose, but it's close enough. Jose, yeah? yeah. It's close enough, right? So, um, so the r uh, research about polis is a international um, collaboration, and I see uh, that people are using polis or polis-like tools more and more because it's open source. You don't have to pay anyone to set it up. I think Singapore also uses it for use policy consultation. Uh, there's m uh, Canada also used it because uh, the French translation is done by the Canadian government because they have that's this bilingual <laughs> thing, and then we work with the. AIT, the de facto U.S. Embassy, also on, on uh, using Polis to work on U.S.-Taiwan relationships. Okay. Can I have one last question? I don't sure, know. why not? Yeah. yeah. Um, this is maybe a little bit personal, but I'll, I'll ask anyways. Sure, of course. <laughs> is that uh, you were openly the first transgender minister in mm -hmm. Taiwan, and mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know as, as, as Westerner mm -hmm. whether it was in any way a mm -hmm. controversial topic when you were mm -hmm. nominated minister? No, not at all. Okay, and I if not, mm -hmm. how do you explain that mm -hmm. broad tolerance of mm -hmm. the uh, public? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's two factors. One is that uh, Taiwan prides ourselves, sees ourselves as the most open society. And it's not just us saying it, it's according to the Civicus Monitor, we're the only Asian country with a completely open civil society. And one of the only two, if you count the Pacific, that's us and New Zealand. And so this is kind of a Taiwanese identity, marriage equality, LGBT friendliness, uh, the Taipei LGBT pride, uh, actually the, the only pride that is physical this year, uh, and things like that, uh, these form part of our identity. And so because of this, uh, people see me or see uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, um, the first uh, women Asian leader who is not part of a political family uh, and things like that and it's part of our identity so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that uh, because I'm not just uh, transgender, I'm also transcultural, I'm also transpartisan, right? Mm -hmm. So so my, my idea is very simple, is to take all the sides. So not only in the HR form when I become the digital minister, I filed uh, not applicable applicable uh, to the gender field. I also found not applicable on the party affiliation really? field. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. So, so I, I'm, I'm transpartisan as well. And, and transpartisan is also a, uh, a new thing in Taiwan. It's actually uh, before 2014, there's not m many uh, pol politicians who will openly say, I would never join any political parties. Uh, and so I think this uh, forms this uh, more coherent um, intersectionality, I think that's the word, uh, the, an intersectional brand uh, about me that I would consistently take all the sides. And in my mind, it's not half of the population different from me. Everybody I can learn something from. Okay, did you vote? I mean, if you are, you know, transpartisan, mm. etc., did mm. you vote? Mm. I vote. Sometimes I go to a voting booth, and in my three votes for the local legislature, for legislature at large, and for president, actually I vote for three different parties' candidates. Uh, okay, yeah. and is it understandable for the public? I mean, yes. Do people trust you? Yes, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah. Because I think in our culture it would be quite complicated to uh -huh. um, be everything and nothing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I'm not nothing. I'm, I'm everything no, at the same time. Nothing, yeah, taking all the sides. Yeah. Taking all the sides. Uh, and, and I think this is, um, I think part of Taiwanese identity is based on the idea that anyone can join uh, if you believe in open innovation and liberal democracy. Uh, and it's not just about cultures that are inherent in Taiwan, but new cultures, new immigrants, uh, and things like that. Uh, and nowadays, we even have this gold card so that people from Czech Republic, for example, uh, who go on a tour in visa, in Taiwan, get a tourist visa. If you want to stay suddenly, you can convert to a three-year stay uh, without having to work for a Taiwanese employer. So this also Taiwanese 
idea uh, is very hip in uh, Taiwan. And we see some Czech people say they're also Taiwanese, now we're very happy. <laughs> so the idea here is that Taiwan is transculturalism in itself. And so we have to take all the sides because we keep getting new cultures infused into our polity. And, and that is also part of Taiwanese identity. Okay, so that's right, because I just wanted to ask you, you know, why is it part of the Taiwanese identity? Mm -hmm, you yeah. say that openness and tolerance mm -hmm. is, so yeah. the next logical question would be, why mm -hmm. is it because of... Yeah, because Taiwan, Taiwan is 20 geography, national languages. Yeah. Historically, people of very different background, very different um, ideologies, I would say. And ge uh, geologically, Taiwan is having earthquake all the time because we're caught between the um, Eurasian plate and Philippine Sea plate, and they bump into each other all the time. And we learn to be resilient, not only in our buildings, but also in our minds, so that after each earthquake, the Jade Mountain I just mentioned grows a little bit. Every year, it's growing by two and a half centimeters because of that. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> right, right. You're, you're quite famous now, right? <laughs> okay. It's nice to know. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, I have a question about the uh, uh, 5G in, in Europe. This is a big topic. Mm -hmm. How big topic is this uh, here in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. And is uh, the Chinese technology uh, the, a big danger for democracy and mm -hmm. for? Yeah, it, it was a very hot topic in 2014, like six years ago. Uh -huh. We had a huge <laughs> debate. Half a million people on the street six, try six to stop years, that. Six years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's called the sunflower movement, right? Uh -huh. um, in the sunflower movement, there's like 20 different NGOs on each side of the uh, parliament, each corner, talking about one aspect of the cross-trade service and trade agreement, exactly as the conversation that Europe is having now. And one side talked about whether for the 4G network that at the time we're building, we have to allow PRC components uh, into it because of the WTO, WTO rules or whatever uh, because of this. Uh, and the consensus on the street was that there is no market player in the PRC. And we understand that the state, the da, there, actually da means party, but it's the same thing in the PRC. Uh, the, the party there uh, can just swap leadership for so-called private companies at any given time. And they have this tendency, uh, later on they call it 国际民退, the state moves forward and the private sector moves backwards. Uh, that basically says they ha there has to be party branches in each and every companies uh, that are making you know significant contributions to geopolitical. And of course, um, 4G components is one such uh, industry. And so we say, okay, even if uh, that we do cybersecurity verification or whatever, um, every single update, we have to do another system risk assessment of whether it has now uh, been yielded de facto control uh, to the DAO uh, at a time. And the total cost of that evaluation will be very large. So we might as well go without any PRC components in our 4G connection. And so nowadays, I think the US is calling it a clean path or something, yes. uh, but, but we implemented that six years ago. So I guess we're happy people are on board uh, on doing their systemic risk assessment, but because there was no PRC component in any of our 4G infrastructure, when we upgraded to 5G and my phone, everything is 5G now, uh, we, we, do not, we do not have to do this evaluation again because uh, there's a past dependency. It's easier if you reuse the same vendors, the same 4G network uh, in for your 5G configuration. So it's not a problem here. And all the five uh, Taiwanese telecoms are on the clean network um, list because uh, we had that conversation six years ago. Uh -huh. So you're completely self-sufficient as Taiwan mm -hmm. when it mm -hmm. comes to 5G. You, you're mm -hmm. not dependent on any, uh, on any PRC. Yeah, I, I think we even did a kind of back uh, catalog of the communication infrastructure component from PRC in 2014. And by 2016, I think we also removed uh, all of that. It took a couple of years time, uh, okay. but we don't have any PRC component in our communication infrastructure for either 4G or 5G now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Did yeah. you take part in this sunflower movement, yes, by the way? Of course. So yeah, you were I, occupying? Yeah, yeah, I am one of the occupiers. Uh, and I was in the parliament uh, to bring them the Ethernet cable so that <laughs> we can live stream outside of the parliament what's happening in the parliament. So I don't have to go into the parliament anymore. I can stay outside and watch TV. Uh, but but in, in more seriousness, we provided uh, communication capabilities, live streaming, and so on to all the different sites. And that's where this take all the sites part comes from. So okay. even for people who are for uh, PRC components, they also have their counter protest. Uh, and we also uh, enable them to live stream their conversation and so on. So basically, we believe that a public discourse is better than rumor. Uh, and with a sufficiently broadband connection, people will eventually agree on common values rather than just you know shoving rumors to one another. Uh, and so that began in 2014. And one of the GovZero team that went to the Sunflower. Can you tell us how long did you stay? Maybe some details about this Occupy uh -huh. um, period? Sure, was of it, course. Was it like 22 days, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, that's that's 22 days. And, and every day there's... So uh, you were there every day in the parliament? Uh, after the live streaming uh, <laughs> sets up, I I'm actually spend most of my time around the parliament. Because at the time, uh, we have this uh, simple idea of... Um, just let me get the presentation through. Right. So, <laughs> yes. So obviously, not all of these people are around the parliament. <laughs> they, they, they are they are in the streets, uh, and we have this idea of broadband as human right. So uh, we need to provide uh, internet connection actually for free uh, in the mediated uh, spaces so that they can hold, for example, the civil constitutional convention and things like that. And Sorry use, to jump in, but was uh, yeah. this the, the sole topic of the Occupy? Or was there no topics? Just or just mm -hmm. this one? Uh, the, 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 right. the topic was on cross-strait service and trade agreement. So all sorts of services are topics. And we even, the GovZero Collective, even delivered this tool uh, called uh, Are You Affected by CSSTA, where you just have to type in your company name or your company registration number and shows exactly how this trade of agreement affects you. And this uh, enabled this kind of matter of fact uh, conversation. And we also made sure that people who, um, this is the thing I talked about. Uh, this is my tweet, by the way. If you go back and read my tweet, you, you get all the uh -huh. first time experience instead of relying on my now aging memory. Uh, right? So this idea is that whatever the Occupy Parliament is having, we work with stenographers, uh, core reporters, to type what they are deliberating, the occupiers were deliberating, because the legitimacy theory was that the MPs refused to do their work. They were on strike. So the people have to go to their office and do their work for them. Uh, and so they actually talk uh, line by line, each of the CSSTA agreement lines, and people on the street can just walk by and see a real-time transcript and broadcasting the live cam, not only to the streets and, and so on. So um, I tweeted uh, saying that I think only a neutral internet can connect people inside and outside of the occupied wall because people who are occupied inside is surrounded by police and we on the outside is counter surrounding the police so the police wouldn't take violent actions and and so uh, the basic idea of getting people inside and outside connected uh, has been uh, the main thing that we um, contributed to and is also a uh, kind of QR code printer uh, that you can just type in your name and it prints this journalist's badge for you because there was a constitutional uh, interpretation that in order to um, you know maintain the normal development and its indispensable mechanism, mm -hmm. the freedom of the press could be exercised by any ordinary citizen according to the Article 11 of the Constitution. And w because many police doesn't know that constitutional interpretation, so we just put a QR code and then the police can scan it and protect <laughs> the, the journalism rights of ordinary citizens and so this has three simple steps uh, upload your photo print your citizen journalist badge and come to start cover for each deliberation uh, among the street and we have a very complex um, arrangement of live video transcripts and things like that in all the occupied places so all of this is documented uh, online and actually in my Twitter uh, but we uh, participate the entire 22 days and it was a victory because the half of the parliament agreed to all the four demands 
of the people who occupy 40 months, not one less. Uh, and then uh, it, uh, we evacuated uh, in triumph, basically. And, and have you demanded so that the constitution is changed? Have you demanded amendments to the constitution? Has it been implemented yet? The demand uh, is basically not to change the constitution per se, but to have a constitutional forum for people to participate oh. and to uh, make okay. direct democracy, which is already a part of the constitution. It was just not very exercised. This conversation we actually had with the Dr. Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek uh, <laughs> the, the last time. The, the Chiang Kai-shek was not that big on direct democracy, but Sun Yat-sen was. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, so, and so we're basically not changing the constitution, but making the direct democracy part of the okay. constitution that was frozen by Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, more alive. So that was the forum was about. And the forum uh, set up the joint platform, the e-participation platform, and V Taiwan and so on. That's all the kind of direct result at the end of 2014 because of that national forum, which is one of the demands of the occupiers. So maybe our last question it, uh, it relates to the current visit of the Czech president of the Senate, Mr. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chill, who is here now. Um, the question is, do you think that this visit, that to be important mm -hmm. for Taiwan, will change anything for mm -hmm. you specifically? Mm -hmm. So to say, do you expect more invitation from mm -hmm. more European or Euro-Atlantic states for mm -hmm. you to come over and, I don't know, talk to your interlocutors? Or what do you see as a result for you of this visit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's two uh, direct results. First of all, I already wake up very early and talk to South and North American people over the video. And I uh, work until the evening to talk to European and African <laughs> states. Uh, I only have so many hours in a day. So I expect invitations will increase, but my capacity will not. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's the first answer. Uh, but, but I think uh, more seriously though, uh, I think uh, it is a great way for people to see that you do not have to make a trade-off between human rights and democracy on one side and public health or public communication or whatever thing that is important for the economy on the other side. Too, too often uh, in other jurisdictions because Wuhan did a lockdown. So people think that you have to do a trade-off. You have to sacrifice human rights to save your economy. Or if you too much focus on the human right, then you have to pay the economic cost. But, but Taiwan proved that we can uh, deepen the democracy by trusting the people while countering the coronavirus in a very participatory way. And I think this message uh, is, I think, both amplified by this visit because Czech Republic shares this value <laughs> about not only mask use, but also about citizen participation and liberal democracy. So I think we can share and amplify this value. I already get um, interview requests uh, from like Sweden and so on uh, to explain like how the Taiwan and Czech Republic <laughs> having come up in, in this sort of uh, trusting on people's power uh, to amplify the epidemiologist uh, uh, knowledge and so on. So I think the Taiwan model is amplified and I sincerely hope uh, that we can work uh, with all the different countries so that people do not think that they have to make a trade-off or a dilemma uh, to have to do lockdown for the pandemic, have to do takedown for the infodemic uh, and things like that. Uh, we can keep the human rights and democracy as values and then also advance them forward while countering the coronavirus. I think this has been um, really, um, I would say, uh, reaffirmed and strengthened by the Czech visit. And um, if the diplomatic bubble can be set up, I am more than willing to visit Czech uh, myself, maybe in October or something. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. You just said it, October, or will it, is it planned? <laughs> uh, so, so um, the long story short, uh, I have this uh, yearly uh, vacation uh, quota, and and I already told my staff uh, to reserve uh, a certain week in October so that I can travel. Uh, but all of this uh, was before the pandemic yeah. gets really bad. <laughs> so so I, I I'm now with a entire week, uh, but nowhere to go. Uh, and <laughs> if there's somewhere uh, for me to go that will make diplomatic sense and that uh, will um, also enhance the message that we both want to amplify, I, I'm more than willing. Uh, I did participate, I think, in the data, the data city congress of Prague, uh, 
um, but uh, it is of course by video conferencing, yeah. it's by telepresence. Uh, but uh, I really look forward to visit in person. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Yes, yes.